Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on Adrenal Crisis Prevention, Preparation, and Management, hosted by the National Adrenal Diseases Foundation. A few quick things before we get started. I want to tell you about the National Adrenal Diseases Foundation. We go by NADF. Our mission is to inform, educate, and support those with adrenal disease and their families to improve their quality of life. Our goals are to stop death from undiagnosed or undertreated Addison's or adrenal insufficiency, to improve life quality for those who do suffer from adrenal disease, and to promote the study of adrenal disease to improve treatments and to find cures. Our work, NADF provides education and awareness and support resources to improve the lives of those with adrenal diseases. Two quick housekeeping disclosures, disclaimers. NADF does not engage in the practice of medicine, is not a medical authority, and does not claim medical knowledge. In all cases, NADF recommends that you consult your own physician regarding any course of treatment or medication. And Dr. Smita Abraham will be joining me shortly. And remarks made by Dr. Abraham represent her own views and do not necessarily represent those of her current or former employers or NADF. So a little bit about me. My name is Erin foley Mudry. I am currently co-president of the National Adrenal Diseases Foundation, and I have been with the foundation in some capacity um, for almost 30 years, either as an active member, a board member, or officer. And part of why I am qualified to be talking with you today is not only my involvement with NADF, but I have a master's in public health and I have lived with primary adrenal insufficiency for over 30 years now. So Dr. Abraham, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Smitha Abraham. I'm a practicing endocrinologist and also have an interest in pituitary and adrenal diseases, specifically adrenal insufficiency. Um, I've been a board member with NADF for about the past two years and very much look forward to talking to you today about adrenal crisis prevention and management. Thanks, Smita. <clears throat> So a quick overview of today's discussion. We're going to start off by going over some results from a survey NADF conducted regarding adrenal crisis treatment. We'll talk about adrenal crisis prevention, identifying adrenal crises, injecting solucortef, how to practice emergency injections. We're gonna look at a video that's provided by Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital. And then we'll talk about NADF's efforts to improve adrenal crisis emergency treatment and have some closing remarks. Okay, so the survey. If you're watching this video, you probably know that adrenal crisis, which I'll be referring to as AC, is a life-threatening complication of adrenal insufficiency or AI that often prevents with very vague, nonspecific symptoms and is associated with significant levels of hospitalizations and death. You may also know that without prompt treatment, there's a high chance of mortality, death, or irreversible complications, unfortunately. And we do know from the NIH that annually about 8% of those like myself with no adrenal insufficiency have an adrenal crisis. So that's yearly 8%. And of those, unfortunately, the death rate is about 6%. And NADF does receive regular reports of these deaths um, and sometimes other negative patient experiences and outcomes. So we wanted to do something about that. We wanted to identify the points of intervention for potential improvement in crisis treatment to help our community to avoid future emergency care visits, which we'll be referring to as ECS from now on, and also to avoid hospitalizations and obviously deaths. Um, and we fielded this survey. So the intent of that survey was to get insights on 
adrenal insufficiency patient experience with emergency injections and also with crisis treatment at emergency care services. The survey itself was posted on the nadf.us website, as well as our social media pages, and all participants responded electronically. Okay, so let's talk about who responded. 535 adults with adrenal insufficiency responded to and participated in this survey. Uh, they were all over 18 years old, a median age of 52, and the significant majority of women which is, were women, which is not surprising given the demographics of adrenal insufficiency overall. I will note that uh, the total respondents were actually 631. That included parents, spouses, and caregivers. But for the purpose of this webinar, we're going to focus on the findings from the 535 adults who actually have AI themselves. So this may or may not surprise you, 74% have required emergency services for crisis at some point since diagnosis. 57% reported a previous need to inject hydrocortisone. And 40% of those were not able to complete the injection. And that's what we want to dive into a little deeper right now. Why? Why are folks finding it so hard to complete the injection? Well, number one, almost 80% of those unable to inject were simply too sick or confused to act. Some site actually starting to pass out during the process. Um, so just that brain fog and that just feeling horrible did not allow them to complete the injection. 38% really needed help with the injection, kind of similar. I mean, these were multiple responses were allowed. So, um, but it was the help was unavailable to them at the time. 22% were simply worried and then unable to inject. So anxiety kind of overcome them, overcame them. 21% could not mix the drug. And we'll talk about some of the difficulties with that later. 9% simply did not have an injection kit. 7% were afraid of the needle stick and the pain. And 7% were simply unsure of how much do I actually give of this medication. So we asked some follow-up open-ended questions um, af after the uh, multiple choice types of questions. And the first one was, can you explain why an emergency injection was needed instead of just going to the hospital or going to the ER? Well, a common theme here is that many people cited previous experiences uh, with emergency care services staff, having a lack of understanding of adrenal crisis, proper crisis treatment protocols, and or the urgency to treat um, with hydrocortisone. And so 16 verbally um, and an open-ended question cited lack of trust, 16. 22 cited excessive wait times to get emergency hydrocortisone in the emergency care setting. Now, that can be, um, generally, we know that emergency rooms <laughs> have long wait times, but then even once you get in to see um, a doctor, there's always a long process, or most often we're finding a long process to actually get the IV or IM injection. And this 26 was kind of a wrap up um, of, of both of those. These folks indicated following endocrinologists instructions or their own best practices that they format uh, formulated over the years of injecting first before you go based on the fact that you're expecting long wait times and subpar emergency care service staff understanding of an adrenal crisis. So as a follow-up um, a little bit here, um, why was the injection needed instead of using the hospital e or ER? 
I would have passed out before getting there, heard too many stories from other AI patients about being denied steroids in the ER. The ER treats you like it's not important or you don't need an, inter an immediate intervention. Uh, one woman said, I did go to the ER, but the doctor left me on the table for a long time. My husband went to look for him. He found him reading about Addison's on the computer, trying to figure it out. At that point, she came to, told her husband the shot was in the car. He went and got it and injected her when the staff were out of the room. Uh, here we see two more quotes about wait time. It's not only the wait time, but the really big lack of knowledge about Addison's, the need for the emergency injection, and for it to be administered in a timely fashion. And again, ER can take two to four hours before even being seen by a doctor. One more open-ended question that we really wanted to feature today is the answers to, do you have anything you would like to add about managing an adrenal crisis, your experiences, or using injection systems? And I should have cited it earlier, but I'll say it now. The open-ended questions that we asked and got responses for are likely like significantly underestimations of the real world findings. The open-ended questions were um, optional. So um, someone could have taken the time to, you know, go through the whole survey of the multiple choice questions and chosen not to dedicate any more time to it. But, you know, 115 of the respondents or 21% did cite specifically in this open-ended question, a need for simplified emergency injection mechanisms or auto injectors. So unprompted, this is their answer to, do you have anything else you'd like to add? And so some of the quotes that we, we saw that really stood out, the current injection process is cumbersome and could be very difficult to manage alone in a crisis. We need something similar to EpiPens or better yet, like AviQ. And for those who are not familiar with AviQ, it's a more sophisticated version of an EpiPen that walks the user through and guides them with a, literally an audio prompt. You know, now remove the cap, now twist, now inject, that kind of a thing. So another quote, I don't like to mix the solution and I don't think I could do it on my own in a crisis, would prefer an EpiPen-like device. One person cited the fact they weren't able to do it. Um, their hands wouldn't work to mix the liquid. Again, there's that brain fog. They kept losing consciousness in this case. Same thing uh, on the top right here, citing very difficult to make it up. You need steady hands. This person needs good lighting and reading glasses. <laughs> you know, I'll be very lucky to manage this in a real emergency. And then finally, for those of us living alone, a symptom is confusion. How are we supposed to deal with this disease and mixing the ingredients and then properly injecting while in this state? So NADF looked at this and we said, you know, what can we do to help our community members avoid crisis and improve crisis management? So. Today, um, Dr. Abraham and myself are going to talk you through um, some things that we can do. We can't speed up the ERs. We can't necessarily make doctors want to learn more, although we will try, uh, about treating emergency um, adrenal crises to influence those doctors, to influence ER management very difficult, but these are some things we can do. So we're going to talk about crisis prevention. We're going to talk about identifying crises. We're going to talk about and watch a video, as I said, on injecting solucortef. Go over the importance of practicing injecting and emergency preparedness best practices. 
So now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Abraham for some information on adrenal crisis prevention. Thanks, Erin. Uh, so like Erin said, you know, there are things that we can do um, that people with adrenal insufficiency and their families can do. Um, and that you know, endocrinologists can, can also do. So the first thing is take your daily steroid replacement dose on a regular schedule as much as possible, as best as you can to avoid doses. The next one is listen to your body. Are you feeling like you have signs of low cortisol? If you have signs of low cortisol, you might consider updosing. Now that term updosing comes with a little bit of a caveat because generally speaking in the medical community amongst endocrinologists mostly, I would say, there are two different types of steroid dosing in adrenal insufficiency. And the first is taking your regular daily dose. And the second is sick day dosing. And those are the two types of dosing that are generally taught and recommended. Updosing is something that's a little bit in the middle. And that is for you listening to your body, understanding if you have signs of low cortisol, or if you anticipate an upcoming period of more stress, like a major life event, final exams, wedding, funeral, you may feel like at those times, your regular daily dose is not quite enough. And that may be very true for you, in which case you might consider up dosing two and a half milligrams or five milligrams of hydrocortisone or some equivalent to help you get through that. And by doing that, you're also helping your body meet its physiologic needs uh, for steroid replacement. But like I said, there's a caveat because this isn't always recognized by all healthcare providers or all endocrinologists. So it's really important for you to discuss your needs with your endocrinologist and together have a mutual understanding of what updosing means for you. There may be times where you end up updosing a lot. It's worth having a conversation with your endocrinologist as to why that might be and what that means for you. Um, and also you wanna have the conversation with your endocrinologist because that person is prescribing you your steroids and giving you a certain number of pills per month. And you wanna have an ample supply to be able to updose should you need it and also to have enough for sick days should you need that. So those are the caveats for updosing, but like we have written here, updose when needed and according to your endocrinologist instructions and together have a plan about what updosing and sick day rules mean for you. Um, so that is our sort of best practice. And in addition, again, we highly wanna reiterate having an ample supply of steroids so that you have enough for your daily doses and you have enough or a little extra for updosing or sick days. So that brings us to the next slide, the management of illness and stress-related medical events. Um, NADF has this guidance that's shown here on the slide. If you find yourself needing more for various illnesses, medical or dental procedures. So for example, if you have an illness with fever, and your fever is 100.4 100 to 102 degrees Fahrenheit. NADF, and I will say generally across the board, these guidelines are, are fairly standard amongst endocrinologists. I would say most of us follow these sick day rules and this is what we recommend to our patients. We recommend that you double the hydrocort your hydrocortisone replacement dose until you're recovered. For example, if you're taking your regular daily dose is 15 milligrams in the morning and five milligrams in the evening, and you have that low grade fever, you should double your dose to 30 milligrams in the morning and 10 milligrams in the afternoon or evening. Now that said, another caveat, let's say you were fine all day, and then at eight o'clock PM, when you're done with your doses, you all of a sudden get sick and you've spiked a temperature. Please don't wait until the next day to take your additional dosing. You can take an additional dose, um, you know, even 
a full day's dose right then and there to help you get through the next 24 hours to help you get started with meeting your body's steroid needs. Um, similarly, if you are going to have dental work, if you're going to have any sort of medical procedure, surgery, we have listed dosage recommendations. It's important to talk to your dentist or the surgeon or whoever's doing the procedure to let them know you have adrenal insufficiency. And usually in those situations, we want you to, depending on what exact procedure you're having, you know, have some extra dose of steroid before you go for the procedure. And then you probably ne need extra steroid during the procedure and then maybe a little bit after the procedure. But again, as we've said in the previous slides, it's really important to talk to your healthcare provider as well as the person doing the procedure to make sure that everybody is on the same page about stress dosing for that procedure to help that procedure go smoothly and without any issues. So now we'll move on to identifying adrenal crisis. Should the unfortunate happen and you find yourself sliding into adrenal crisis or you're already there, we wanted to share with you some symptoms um, that are often reported in this setting. Now, a reminder again, an adrenal crisis, what's happening there? It's usually the result of some extreme physical or emotional stress that does not get the replacement steroid coverage necessary to meet that stress. So there's a disconnect between what your body needs in terms of the levels of cortisol and what it has been given. Typical symptoms are a severe drop in blood pressure that might cause you to feel dizzy or lightheaded or possibly even lose consciousness, nausea, vomiting, Confusion, which Erin mentioned earlier, especially in some of the quotes that we got from adrenal in, adrenally insufficient patients who took the survey, um, that confusion is of, often associated with a brain fog, um, muscle weakness or cramps, headaches. Um, like I said, the brain fog. Some people even report feeling like they have or have, if they've taken their blood pressure, a short period of high blood pressure while they're in crisis or heading into crisis a buzzy feeling and all of a sudden feeling very irritable or having a very low temper threshold. And just again, which I think most of you probably know, but crises are potentially life-threatening medical emergencies and more than likely will require some stress dose injection and or emergency care services management. Now about stress or emergency dose injections, we've been talking about it a little bit and we're gonna talk about it more. Um, if you get to the point where you need an injection because you're either not able to take your pills or the amount of pills that you have is not enough, there are currently two available stress dose injections that are FDA approved. One is Solucortef, often in the form of the Actovial, which is shown here. There's also intramuscular dexamethasone that comes in solution that can be used as a stress or emergency dose injection. Generally, NADF recommends using solucortef using the Actovial. It's just a slightly easier system to use. When it is available, we are fully aware uh, that there is a shortage right now of the Actovial and solucortef, and we are desperately hoping that that shortage resolves sooner than later. In the meantime, however, please note that um, if you don't have an injection or your injection is ex uh, expired, you can talk to your healthcare provider or your endocrinologist about pre uh, prescribing intramuscular dexamethasone as a stress dose. Now, the last point for this slide is we do recommend that you inject prior to departing for the emergency room, just like Erin mentioned in the earlier slides. Um, you know, a lot of people go to the emergency room and there are wait times. And so if you have that injection in place, it's going to help you get through that waiting period until they're able to provide you care. So we do recommend that you inject prior to departing for emergency care services if you can safely administer the dose, either you or your loved one or a caregiver. So now um, we're going to actually show a video um, that's available online um, by Memorial Sloan Kettering. But before we do that, I just want to quickly talk about um, the injection in the sense that 
the reason we're showing the video is for education and training on how to inject because you know injecting yourself anytime is not comfortable and it's feels a little bit unusual and so we wanted to go over the available resources for administering intramuscular injections we also then want to show you the video so first NADF has several resources available at nadf.us, including a training PDF that you can use or a caregiver can use to prepare oneself or a person for self-injection. Um, in addition to preparation for injection, we want to, we just talked about how people feel confused and have a brain fog, but at the same time, we're sort of saying stay calm and focused will help you successfully administer the injection to yourself or a loved one. And the reason we're saying that is to sort of hone in on the point that practicing, if you can, um, in, in safe ways, and we'll talk about that, uh, will help you develop a muscle memory so that if you're in that unfortunate situation where you either have to administer an injection to someone or to yourself, you have that muscle memory in, put in place from the education and the training that will hopefully allow you to stay a little calmer and a little bit focused as you administer the injection. Yeah, that muscle memory is so important. And you can think about it like um, getting certified in CPR or something. You know, um, we would never hope to come across someone who needed it. But the hope is that once you're trained in it, that the, you know, kind of your body goes into auto mode and and that can be especially true for a caregiver they are not in brain fog you are um but either way it's helpful and highly encouraged and so now we're going to jump over to about a five minute video again this is from memorial sloan kettering cancer center um, they are a world-renowned hospital um, and highly respected, and we want to share this with you. So here we go. In this video, we'll show how to give an emergency shot using Solucortef Activil. It's important that you, your friends, and your family know how to give this shot. They'll need to help you if you can't do it yourself. You may need a Solucortef shot if you have a serious injury, if you're losing a lot of blood, if you're throwing up, if you're too sick to take your daily cortisol medication, or if you faint. Your doctor may tell you to give yourself an emergency Solucortef shot in other situations, too. If they do, follow their instructions. If you have any of these symptoms, you or your caregiver need to call your doctor's office right away. If you can't reach them, give yourself the emergency Solucortef shot or have your caregiver do it for you. To give the shot, first set up your supplies on any clean, open surface. You'll need a Solucortef Activile bottle, two alcohol wipes, a sterile syringe with a needle, a gauze pad, a bandage, and a sharps container to safely throw the syringe and needle away. You can use an empty laundry detergent bottle with a screw-on cap. Check the expiration date on the Solucortef bottle. If it's expired, don't use it. Check if you have another bottle that isn't expired. If you don't, call 911. Next, clean your hands with soap and water or an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. If you're using soap and water, wet your hands and apply soap. Rub your hands together well for at least 20 seconds, then rinse. Dry them with a paper towel and use that same towel to turn off the faucet. If you're using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer, be sure to cover all parts of your hands with it, rubbing your hands together until they're dry. Once your hands are clean, pick up the Solucortef bottle. Push down on the yellow cap so the liquid in the top part mixes with the powder in the bottom part. Then turn the bottle upside down a few times until the medication turns clear. 
That means it's fully mixed. Once the liquid is clear, take off the yellow tab on the top of the bottle. You'll see an orange rubber stopper underneath. Clean the top of the bottle with an alcohol wipe. Pick up the syringe and take the cap off the needle. Turn the bottle upside down and stick the needle into the middle of the orange rubber stopper. Make sure the tip of the needle is in the liquid. Gently pull the plunger back to fill the syringe with all the medication in the bottle. Then pull the needle out of the bottle. Look at the syringe to see if there are any air bubbles inside. If there are, hold the syringe with the needle pointing up and tap it with your fingers until the air bubbles rise to the top near the needle. Slowly push the plunger to force the air bubbles out of the syringe. Be careful not to push out any medication. Once the syringe is ready, put the cap back on the syringe and place it on a clean surface. Use the other alcohol wipe to clean the skin about halfway up your thigh, towards the outer side of your leg. This is where you'll give yourself the shot. Pick up the syringe and take off the cap. Hold the syringe in your fist, making sure your thumb is not on the plunger. Using your other hand, press down on your skin where you're going to give yourself the shot. When you're ready, put the needle straight down into your thigh in one quick motion. Move your thumb to the plunger and slowly push the plunger down to inject the medication into your thigh. Keep the needle in your thigh for 10 seconds so the medication goes into your body. Then pull it straight out and set it aside. Press down on your thigh with the gauze for a few seconds. Then put on the bandage. Put the syringe and needle in the sharps container. Then call 911. You may need more medical care. If you have any questions, call your doctor's office. You can also find more resources on our website, www.msk.org PE. So we're back. Uh, hopefully you were able to get something out of watching that video. Um, and the good news is this webinar will probably live on the internet for many, many years. So you can always come back and look at that video through our presentation. And that video is also publicly available online. Now, we talked about education and training and practicing. So that sort of brings us to some more specific guidance on how to prepare for an adrenal crisis. But first, we wanted to comment on the fact that as good as that video was, the woman in the video gave her, herself the injection, but she doesn't really appear ill. She doesn't really appear to be in crisis um, and she doesn't appear confused or with any brain fog. So that may not be exactly the real world setting that you find yourself or your loved one in. Um, we're fully aware and our members and our board members um, like Aaron, very much are aware and sympathetic and empathetic to the fact that it is common to feel very anxious or in, uneasy when you're either giving or receiving an injection. Um, and the confusion and the brain fog associated with the crisis make it very important then to practice drawing up and injecting before one is actually needed. Again, that term muscle memory is really important here. And so what we would recommend if you can make it happen is requesting and getting an instructional session with a member of your you know, healthcare providers team, your endocrinologist team, somebody in the office who can sit there and sort of teach you how to do it. Um, sometimes um, your endocrinologist may be willing to prescribe two to three vials of sterile saline and two to three needles or syringes for you to practice injecting at home, not practice injecting on yourself, but learning how to draw up the medication into the syringe and perhaps, you know, injecting it into uh, an orange, which we described below. So 
Sometimes you could consider using an expired Cellucor TEF or an expired dexamethasone vial to practice the process of drawing up the medication, but absolutely do not inject that expired medication into yourself or anyone else or any other living thing. <laughs> so we just want to make sure that that's very clear. This is purely uh, for practicing reasons. We recommend that you utilize an orange, which it has, um, you know, the, the way the orange is with the peel and then the fruit inside, it's a really good proxy for feeling how you're going to feel some resistance as you insert the needle through the skin, which is the orange peel, and push the solution into the tissue, which is inside the fruit of the orange. Then you want to throw that orange out immediately. Don't eat it. Um, don't feed it to any animals or any pets. I wouldn't throw it outside. Just throw it in your compost or in the garbage. Um, so Again, we just want to highlight here the importance of practicing injecting and practicing injecting safely, and ideally, if you can, uh, with an instructional session with a healthcare provider on your on your team. And I know it sounds almost silly um, to, and I actually have an orange here um, just in case we wanted to practice, um, but. It sounds a little silly to practice on the orange, but once you do it, feeling it's not just the needle resistance. It's that if you haven't done it before, it feels a little bit like the um, plunger is stuck because it can it can be slow. It's not a you know a exceptionally thin liquid for one thing, and it is going into other uh, semi liquid uh, tissue. So it needs a little time, a little, you know, gentle persuading. So um, at least for me, um, doing that for the first time, I was surprised at the resistance that I got. And um, I think it's a really good proxy. Uh, so some other best practices that we have for you. Um, actually, NADF has emergency kit recommendation. I'm sorry, emergency kit recommendations. And so there's an NADF emergency wallet card that you can find online, which is pictured here. Uh, so that will have emergency information, emergency contact, your endocrinologist information. There's also an NADF emergency care crisis alert flyer, which is also shown here, which provides an emergency room treatment protocol, especially if you're in a remote area where um, physicians may not encounter this as frequently. And so that might be really helpful for you to provide to them. Also online, but not shown on this slide is an adrenal crisis care letter for emergency staff um, that we recommend you print out, have signed by your endocrinologist, and then keep it with you should you have to go to the emergency room. We also recommend, uh, especially nowadays, so many medical systems have electronic health records and they often have a patient portal like a MyChart or some such thing. And so you, if you have your phone with you, you know, should have your EHR login and password easily accessible because when you're in the ER, it's very helpful to the physician if you're showing them like, oh, this is my last endocrinologist note and these are my regular medications. It sort of makes some of that, any diagnostic enigmas are sort of um, quickly, um, you know, quickly dispersed and it's easier then to get to diagnosis and treatment once you're in the ER. Then in terms of an actual kit, perhaps keeping it in a zippered pouch with a big label that says, you know, uh, steroid emergency kit where you keep your actual vial or dexamethasone vial, the syringe, probably maybe two syringes just in case you need it, a couple of needles if the needles are not already attached to the syringe, alcohol swabs, and a Band-Aid. And honestly, if you want to keep any notes, for yourself so that in that time where you're confused or you have the brain fog or if somebody else has to give it to you, things that you know about yourself or how, you know, tips that you can give yourself to get that administered, you know, as seamlessly as possible. Um, 
more than likely, like nine times out of the 10, if you have to give yourself the injection, you're either sliding into or pretty close to a crisis. And so things to expect when you are in the hospital or receiving emergency care treatment, uh, IV saline, which is basically fluids to keep you hydrated and to keep the salt concentration in your blood at the right level. Uh, they will likely give you IV hydrocortisone or dexamethasone in addition to the saline. Um, they will closely monitor your blood pressure, your electrolytes, like your sodium, potassium, your kidney function even, your blood sugar to make sure that those are all stable. And then in terms of, you know, you might be like, well, if that happens to me, how long might I be kind of stuck in the hospital? It could be that depending on whatever your situation is, you might only be in the ER for, you know, overnight or eight to 12 hours or something like that. But it could be depending on what was the source that led you into crisis that you have to be there for longer if you have an illness that requires more attention. So it depends on the severity of the crisis, the underlying precipitating factors, and your overall health as you enter the emergency care service. Some additional remind, reminders, um, when you're talking to your endocrinologist or whoever's prescribing your steroids, um, you know, please do make sure that they prescribe you the Activile and, and intramuscular syringes. Um, one of the things that I think NADF would love to see and which we're slowly trying to work on is sort of, you know, creating an alert and an order set so that it's very easy for physicians to prescribe all the necessary, all the necessary tools for your emergency kit. Um, so if the Activile, which has the powder and solution in one sort of two vials that are attached together, if that's not available, sometimes you might get the Solucortef powder vial, in which case you will also need a separate vial that has saline solution in it. So it's very similar in terms of um, you know, how to inject it, but you have to reconstitute the medication. So you would have to, with your syringe, draw up two milliliters of your saline, inject that into the Solucortef powder vial, gently irritate the vial until you can see that the powder has dissolved into the solution and then draw up that medication, all of it from the vial into your syringe and then inject yourself very similar to how it was done, if not the same as to how it was done in the video. So um, another important reminder is that we recommend that you open your prescription while you're still at the pharmacy to make sure that you have the active vial and syringes, or you have the powder vial with a separate solution. Um, if you get the intramuscular dexamethasone, that should come in a solution by itself. So you would just need the dexamethasone solution and the syringes. And again, dexamethasone is a very valid alternative stress dose injection. Um, remember to call your endocrinologist or go to the nearest emergency care services um, system after you've had an injection of solucortef or should you have dexamethasone. Thanks, Mita. So um, I just want to add on to this really quickly about how important it is that you open your little prescription bag while you're still in the pharmacy to make sure that you either have an active vial, or if you have um, solucortef powder vial, that you also have the separate saline or other solution vial that was prescribed along with the syringes. Um, I had a, a horrible experience where um, I was in Jamaica on my honeymoon and I went into crisis and I was so sick and I was like, I've got this, I've got my emergency kit, I'm all ready. I only had the powder and I was stuck. So um, everything turned out fine, but it could have been really bad. And fast forward, you know, 15 years later, I go to my local pharmacy, I fill it, I come home, I open it, 
guess what? I got just the powder again. So you really have to check it. The boxes look identical on the shelves. Uh, very rare for pharmacists to have to fill it. So it's an easy mistake for them to make. Uh, also easy mistake for someone who doesn't prescribe it often to make. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what NADF is doing uh, to try to improve some of these issues um, with crisis emergency treatment, and then talk a little bit about how you all can help us. So what are we doing? Well, one thing is uh, we are communicating regularly with the FDA. We're communicating with Pfizer to ensure Salucortep is available. And, and honestly, um, really all of our medications, we've seen sporadic shortages um, and back order supplies of them um, over the past few years. But we are working with the FDA, we're working with, with Pfizer, and we're working with Greenstone and some of the other um, generic manufacturers. Um, as soon as we become aware of those shortages and issues, we're reaching out and, and we do have contacts there. Um, we're also supplying things like this instructional webinar that live on our website. Uh, there are also numerous emergency handouts that are printable on nadf.us. We showed a few of them and we definitely discussed them throughout this session. Uh, Dr. Smita um, had mentioned electronic health record alert initiative. We are Working slowly but surely on this, this is a complicated one, but our goal, our hope is that um, at some point, if you have um, adrenal insufficiency, you have a diagnosis already, you land in the ER, that, um, you know, a big alert comes up on your record that says, you know, do not wait, give IV, um, you know, salucortev immediately. But it's it's a process and it's a a lot of systems we have to navigate. So, but we are working on it and we're very hopeful about that. The last thing I want to talk about um, regarding improving crisis emergency treatment is NADF has been partnering partnering um, on recruitment for clinical trials um, for several things, um, some of them being new. Um, drugs for um, adrenal diseases, including, you know, pediatric adrenal insufficiency and CAH, but we're also partnering with um, three different organizations developing auto-injectors. So would you want to help us? Can you help us? Consider volunteering your time for NADF. There's all kinds of things that, um, you know, we need help with. There's support groups, you know, online support groups. Are you a graphic designer Help can help us design these types of presentations? Are you really good with website design? Um, so many things. If you have a skill, um, are you a lawyer? Are you an accountant? You know, we need all of that kind of help. Um, and then also, and so consider volunteering. It can be one hour a month. It can be a few hours just in April Awareness Month doing a little fundraiser on your own and raising awareness. But reach out with ideas. We'd love to hear them. And then, of course, donating. Um, when you donate, you support our very important work in improving adrenal crisis emergency treatment, as well as research, which we are really starting to see some traction on at NADF, um, partnering both with pharmaceutical companies on research and conducting our own research. Um, we have the My AI uh, registry, patient registry, check that out on nadf.us. And we're working on an arm of that that's gonna involve um, blood sampling and looking at cortisol levels in the blood over time. So some big stuff happening in there. We're trying to do a lot more HCP education um, and awareness among that uh, group. Uh, you can help us with your donations by helping us manufacture, produce, and send out support and education materials for the newly diagnosed. It's 
really helpful for them when they're so overwhelmed to have something concrete to look at and go back to and go back to. Um, again, our ongoing support groups, funding helps with those too. And helping, you know, so that we can pay our staff um, that are helping us communicate with pharmaceutical manufacturers and the FDA um, to ensure we have our life sustaining and our life saving medications that we all rely on. Um, and we want to make sure they're available consistently. So you can donate directly to NADF. Um, just go to nadf.us and there is a little tab right there that says support us. Um, and please, please do reach out with ideas. We would love to hear from you. And um, again, all of the things we showed today and this webinar are all available on nadf.us. And I want to give a big thank you to Dr. Smita Abraham for co-crafting this webinar with me and delivering it as well as to Dr. Liz Reagan and Lori Engler, who um, Dr. Reagan is on our board and conducted the survey last year. And Lori Engler is currently our executive director and helped to um, dissect that data for us. So big thank you to them and all of our NADF staff and board members.